one individual, one character in the New Testament who did, in fact, practice what he preached, who did, in fact, model the truth, embody the truth in his everyday experience. It was the Apostle Paul. In fact, of all of the individuals that we read about in the New Testament, Paul was one of, if not the outstanding example of Christian character, which is why he could say to the Corinthian believers in 1 Corinthians, I also imitate Christ. You know, the word that is translated imitate in that verse in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, in the Greek is the word mimetai, from which we get our word mimic, mimic me. Because of his faithfulness to the Lord, because of his exemplary dedication, Paul could actually recommend that to other Christians. And because of his faithfulness to the Lord, Paul could commend it to Timothy. Here in 2 Timothy 3.10, for doing verse the indicators that Paul has been talking about, in the previous four verses, followed the I mean, when they hear it, for Paul. No, all throughout his epistles, he was always talking about it, stressing it, stressing its importance. Now, I urge you, brethren, note, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. Roman sick children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, Ephesians 4:14. 4, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished in the words of faith and of the good doctrine which you have carefully followed. 1 Timothy 4, 6. All scripture by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, 2 Timothy 4.3. You know, when you examine the writings of the Apostle Paul, you see that as doctrine, 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 doctrine. This was a perennial theme with him, to say the least. Why? Because as Paul understood that, which is just a synonym for biblical truth, people are doomed. See, unless a non-believer comes to grips with right, right doctrine concerning who he is and concerning who Jesus is and what he has done, he cannot be saved. And unless a believer in Jesus Christ comes to grips with right doctrine, he cannot be sanctified. He cannot grow in the Lord, which means what? Which means that doctrine, theology, is not just for egg-headed, ivory tower theologians. Now, if you know the Lord this morning, theology is for you. You know, I like what John Gerstner has said in his little book entitled Theology for Every Man. He writes this, laymen sometimes think that they need not be theologians. That, however, is a very great mistake. They do need to be theologians. In fact, that is the one vocation every man is obliged to follow. A layman does not need to be a plumber, a carpenter, a lawyer, a doctor, a teacher, a laborer, a housewife. These are all possibilities, not necessities. A, lay, a layman may be one of these or the other as he chooses, but he must be a theologian. This is not an option with him, but a requirement. 
Timothy was a theologian, not just intellectually, but practically. He came to grips with Paul's theology, and then he implied, and we must do the same, notwithstanding the work, the effort, and the study that that will require. To begin with, uh, this morning, we are to follow Paul in the area of doctrine. Now, secondly, of life, or as we read in the NIV, way of life. You know, in contradistinction to some believers today, Paul's way of life was predominantly Christian. This is abundantly clear as one looks at the New Testament. In other words, Paul was not a periodic Christian, so to speak, an occasional Christian. No, instead, for Paul, Christianity was a way of life, and that's what it became for Timothy as well. Dear Uncle Douglas went home to be with the Lord. It was said to me about him by another family member, his whole life is about the Lord. His whole life is about the Lord. Now, it wasn't always that way with my dear Uncle Douglas. My Uncle Douglas was a Canadian Mountie. And he lived a carnal life for a number of years, got divorced, came about the Lord. You know, wouldn't it be great if it could be said about you, you know, Peter, your whole life is about the Lord. Social interactions are about the Lord. Their free time is about the Lord the Lord. You know, with all my beings ramps and powers, all my thoughts and words and doings, all my days and all my hours. You know, folks, God is not looking for part-time Christians today. He's looking for full-time Christian, for believers who are absolutely obsessed with him. You know, I remember before I got married, a friend of mine said, I can't stop thinking about that person. That's the only time you get married. Well, you know, that's how it should be when it comes to us in the Lord. Our mind should be preoccupied with Him day and night, 24-7. Now, thirdly, this morning, we are to follow in the area of purpose. We're to follow in the area of purpose. You know, the first question which we find in the Westminster Catechism is, what is the chief end of man? And many of you know the answer to that. It's to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And you know, that in fact is what Paul's ultimate purpose was in life, to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And that was a Timothy's purpose, and it must be our purpose as well. Now, how that is specifically fleshed out in our life is going to be different for each of us. For Paul and Timothy to glorify God meant traveling about, preaching the gospel, and teaching the word. For you, however, glorifying God might mean preaching the gospel and teaching the word in Africa, or in China, or in Japan, or right here in America. Whatever it may mean, what's important is that you've got purpose and that your purpose squares with God's purpose. You know, when you talk to some Christians, you quickly discover that their aim, their goals in life are essentially the same as that of the unsaved. They want to climb the corporate ladder and they want to make a lot of money and they want that house on the lake and that condo in Florida. That's what's driving them, impelling them compelling them in life. Those kinds of materialistic dreams. You now, if that's where you are at this morning, then our, I dare say you need to get your goals out of the gutter, to set your sights much higher. After all, you, believer, have bigger fish to fry. You have more important things to do. You know, sometimes you'll hear it asked, what are you doing for heaven's sake? And, you know, that's a legitimate question for every believer. What are you doing for heaven's sake? 
Because you see, the glory of God and the cause of Jesus Christ must be our priority. Now we see here that fourthly, we are to follow in the area of faith. I'll tell you what strong faith the Apostle Paul had. That's why he was able to survive, why he was able to make it, why he was able to cope through all of the difficulties and hardships and challenges that he was confronted with. And was Paul confronted with challenges or what? I mean, I think of his testimony. And first, our, we both hunger and thirst and are naked and are buffeted and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we suffer it. Being defamed, we entreat. We are made as the filth of this world and as the offscoring of all things unto this day. Now, how was able, Paul able to cope? I mean, Paul was stoned and left for dead outside of the city of Lystra. How was he able to cope? He was able to cope through faith. And that's how you and I can cope as well. See, as we make our way through life, as believers in Jesus Christ, through faith, we can be assured, number one, that he's sovereign, that he is in control, that he's the master of every situation. We may not always understand all that he's doing, but we can have the certitude that he's in charge. And number two, we can have the assurance that God is always with us, that he will never leave us nor forsake us, Hebrews 13, 5, and that consequently he will supply all of our need and strengthen us for the journey, strengthen us for daily living. And knowing these things should enable us to cope, should provide us with such peace of mind, with, sh with such tranquility of spirit, with such a calmness of soul. You know, years ago, on a particular Monday, Rhonda and I took our children to a park that was located next to our home. And while we were there, my second youngest daughter, Bella, whom many of you know, had to use the laboratory. Well, Rhonda discovered as a result of this that she was emitting blood unnaturally and she shared this with me well upon hearing this i started to get a little bit excited i started to freak out a little bit to which my wife responded to which Rhonda responded i'm taking her donald to the doctor and in the meantime i'm going to trust the lord Pastor Don, what a rebuke that was. I'm reminded of Saul's words to David in 1 Samuel 24, 17. After David spared his life in the wilderness of Engedi, Saul said to him, you are more righteous than I. At that particular moment, my dear wife, Rhonda, was more righteous than I. Of course, you realize those moments are very few and far between. But at that particular moment, she was more righteous than I. Now, fifthly, this morning, we are to follow in the area of long-suffering, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit that we read about in the fifth chapter of the book of Galatians. You know, I like what the New Testament commentator William Barclay says concerning this. He writes, the word here is macrothumia. And macrothumia, as the Greeks used it, usually meant patience with people. It is the ability not to lose patience when people are foolish, not to grow irritable when they seem unteachable. It is the ability to accept the folly, the perversity, the blindness, the ingratitude of men, and still to remain gracious and still to toil. For a virtue that is not only absent in the world, it's a virtue that far true believer in Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this morning, how patient with people are you and I really? Are we patient or do we strike back? Do we retaliate almost immediately for Jesus' sake, except the wrongs that others perpetrate against? Well, praying 
looking for it. them and buyer invariably to get even. Forbearance and long sight to repent. Romans 2 4. Our God is a long suffering God. We have love, which of course is the basis for long suffering. I'll tell you, the Apostle Paul was a great lover of men. He loved the unsaved, which is why he worked tirelessly in the gospel ministry, preaching the saving message of Christ from town to town. You know, one of the places in the New Testament where you really come eyeball to eyeball with the love of Paul, in that chapter we see of antiquity, and he saw that the city was given over to idols. You know, it was said that it was easier to find a God in that than a man. I mean, the streets were absolutely lined with idols. And Paul gets to Athens. Acts 17, that his spirit was provoked within him. That word provoked, which we find there in Acts 17, 16, is also found in 1 Corinthians 13, 5, where it is rendered, at least in the NIV, angered. It's not easily angered. When Paul saw that the city, the avant-garde city of Athens, was immersed in idolatry, he was provoked, he was angered. He was teed off, ticked off. Why? Because of the love that he had for the people in, the, in that city. That's why Acts 17 goes on to say, Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Paul loved the unsaved, and he also loved his brothers and sisters in Christ, which is why he continually shared with them the truth of God's word which could alone affect their spiritual growth. Now, of course, in proclaiming God's message to saints and sinners alike, Paul made some adversaries along the way. He aroused some opposition. He said to the Galatian believers in Galatians 4.16, Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the tr truth? Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? But you know, Paul didn't care about, about the hostility against himself that he could potentially stir up because of his preaching. He wasn't out to be liked. He wasn't out to win a popularity contest. No, he loved people too much to worry about that. And so he just fired away, which is why you could say to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, 27, just before he left the city of Ephesus, I have not shunned to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. Now notice with me finally this morning that we're to follow in the area of perseverance. Paul writes, but you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. You know, again, the Apostle Paul did not have it easy in life. In fact, he talks about that, and yet, in spite of how rough it was for him, he did not quit. He did not throw in the towel. Some of you may remember that famous fight between Sugar Ray Leonard and Roberto Duran, in which at a certain point, Duran and he quit. God. There was never a time when it's done, it's over. Believer in Jesus Christ, don't have to quit either. You know, some believers quit their marriages, they quit their ministries. They quit all sorts 
sorts of things. For the grace that is yours in Christ, you can hang in there, which is exactly what will reward you. Of Second Timothy in Second Timothy four seven, Paul says, "I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I didn't quit. I did not quit. I finished. I finished the." The race. I never said no mas. Like Roberto Duran. I never said it. I finished the race. I kept the faith. I guarded the faith. Then he goes on to say, a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. The Apostle Paul was an outstanding believer, an outstanding Christian. He wasn't perfect. No Christian is perfect. Paul said in Romans 7, 19, the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not, this I do. But he was certainly outstanding, which is why Timothy was in following him and praised for doing just that. And Paul's dedication, his dedication to the Lord is something that we ourselves should emulate. We should follow the leader, keeping in mind that we too will be rewarded. Probably everybody who's listening this morning is saved. Perhaps you're not. The gospel is so simple, but so profound and so wonderful. You know, I was in a bunch of people from Windsor and the virus and end times. These are great people. I told them, you know, I'm reticent, of course, to set a date. and logical implications of certain things that are taking place in the world, people, false hope, false impressions. But I did say to this group, I said, I think the Lord's return is soon. And we all talked about the fact, what are the implications of that? The implications of that is we need to throw out the old lifeline. As my old pastor, David D. Allen, used to say all the time, throw out the old lifeline. Win as many people to Christ as you possibly can. And you may be one of those who needs to be won to Christ. If you're not saved, if you're not a believer, here's the great message of the gospel. A rotten sinner like me can go to heaven through simple faith in Jesus Christ, not through good works, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us, Titus 3, 5, but simply by trusting in Christ. That makes Christianity unique from every other religion in the world. Religion says you got to do something. you got to pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. you got to earn your stripes. Christianity says you can't do No can do. No can do. All our righteousness is as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. The only way you get into heaven is through the righteousness of another, being clothed with the righteousness of another. You know, to use a Latin phrase, salvation is extra nos. It's outside of ourselves. It has nothing to do with us. We need an alien righteousness, a foreign righteousness. And when you trust in Christ alone, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to you. It's credited to your account. Your sin is credited to him, and his righteousness is credited to, to you. And then you can sing, bold shall I stand in that great day, for who ought to my charge shall lay. Fully absolved from these I am, from sin 
and fear and guilt and shame. But now, 